Very well. Our final study for today. We are going to begin on page 247 of your syllabus. Or I, I was told that you're supposed to say your syllabi, <laughs> not syllabuses. But then Mel, Melvin had a good comeback on that one, which I'm not going to share right now. <laughs> But uh, anyway, we're going to begin on page 247, and basically that's the only page that we're going to deal with uh, until we go all the way to page 269. Uh, so the pages in between, 249 to 269, those pages describe, by the publications of the day, the great earthquake, the sun and moon, signs in the sun and moon, and the falling of the stars. So you can read all of those reports of eyewitnesses, uh, many people felt that the end of the world had come. Others felt that the judgment was right around the corner. Other, some people were scared and some people were, were comforted that Jesus was, gonna, was coming. So uh, they, they definitely saw that these signs were unusual. Something unusual was happening. So let's have a word of prayer and then we'll read Matthew 24, uh, 29 to 31. And then I'll make some comments from the Spirit of Prophecy. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we study this last session today, we ask for the guidance of your Spirit. As we have asked before, we can't help but marvel at how wonderful and uh, how harmonious is your Word. Help us, Lord, to understand what we're going to study in this session. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's notice Matthew 24. This is not in your syllabus. Uh, Matthew 24, 29 to 31. I want you to notice the order of events that we have here. The order of events. Uh, verse 29 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, so first of all you have the tribulation, right? The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. So first of all, the tribulation comes to an end. You have the signs in the heavens, and then verse 30 says, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. So the signs in the sun, moon, and stars announce the coming of Jesus, right? So it says, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then what's going to happen with all of the people? Oh, the tribes of the earth will what? Mourn. Will mourn. Is this when they're crying for the rocks to fall upon them and hiding in the caves? which would be the Revelation's version? Yes. So it says, And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And then notice the following event, that he, uh, And He will send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together His elects from the four winds from one end of the heaven to the other. Now, I want you to notice how Ellen White describes this sequence of events in the exact order in the book Great Controversy. Uh, Great Controversy 613, we're at the top of page 247 now. Great Controversy 613 to 634, Ellen White describes the Great Tribulation, which is the first thing that uh, Matthew chapter uh, 24 and verse 29 mentions. So she mentions the time of trouble, uh, which is the first phrase in Matthew 24, 29. Then on pages 635 to 637, in the chapter God's people delivered, she mentions the signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. Then, in, uh, following that, Jesus descends from heaven, and the living saints ask the question, who shall be able to stand? Let's read about it there. Uh, before His presence all faces are turned into paleness, upon the rejecters of God's mercy falls terror of eternal despair. The heart melteth and the knees smite together, and the faces of them all gather blackness. So let me ask you, is she describing uh, the distress that Matthew mentions here, that uh, uh, all the tribes of the earth will mourn as they see the Son of Man coming? Is she describing the same but in different words? Absolutely. And then notice the next thing is the righteous cry with trembling, who shall be able to stand? Is that the ending question in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 17? 
Yes, who shall be able to stand? The angel's song, now because this is the seventh seal, the angel's song is hushed, and there is a period of what? Of awful silence. And then you have the final event that's mentioned in Matthew 24. A few pages later, Ellen White describes the arrival of Jesus and the sending of His angels to gather together His elect. Let's read it. The living righteous are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the voice of God. They were glorified. At the voice of God they were glorified. Now they are made immortal and with the risen saints are caught up to meet their Lord in the air. Angels gather together His elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Do you see how she's discussing Matthew 20, uh, chapter 24, 29 to 31 in the exact order? So the signs that are mentioned there in the sun, moon, and stars, and the earthquake in Matthew 24, uh, is that occurring uh, leading up to 1844, or are these signs taking place as an announcement of the second coming of Christ? It's clearly the second set of signs, the second part of the sixth seal. Okay, now let's go to page 269 and discuss a little bit more the second stage of the sixth seal. So are you clear on the first stage of the sixth seal? The first stage are the signs in the heavens, the great earthquake that announces the end of the 1260 days, the end of the tribulation of God's people, the beginning of the time of the end, and that soon the judging part of the fifth seal is going to take place. God's people are going to be vindicated in the heavenly judgment. But now we want to talk about the second phase or the second part of the sixth seal. As stated before, the question of the martyrs in the fifth seal had to do with two events that are related, yet separate, judging and avenging. The first part of the sixth seal has to do with the first part of this plea, by the beginning of the judgment in heaven. That is to say, in 1844 God began the judgment process in heaven to vindicate the saints that the little horn oppressed for three and a half times. Part one of the sixth seal deals with the judge aspect. The great earthquake and the signs in the heavens in the sixth seal announced the approach of this stage. The second part of the sixth seal deals with the second part of the martyr's plea, that is the avenge aspect. We can see this clearly in Revelation 6.17. The Lamb will now pour out His wrath upon those who oppressed His people during the second stage of persecution. In between the two stages of the sixth seal, the judgment of Revelation 7, 1 through 8 takes place. That's the interlude between the sixth and the seventh seal. First, uh, the first part of the sixth seal. And uh, so let's continue here. First, God vindicates the martyrs whom the little horn slew during the 1260 years, as well as those who have professed the name of Jesus. And then at the very end of this heavenly judgment process, God will judge and seal the 144,000 living saints. By the way, this is still happening during the first stage of the sixth seal. So the avenging part is the second coming of Christ. So what takes place during the judging phase of the sixth seal? God judges, first of all, those who died, right? Including the martyrs. And then He judges whom? The 144,000, those who are alive. Probation closes, the time of trouble, and then you have the signs in the heavens, sun, moon, and stars, that announce the second coming of Christ. That's the chronology. Now, uh, let's notice this statement from Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 483. As the books of record are opened, record are opened in the judgment, the lives of how many? I thought it was only the martyrs. Is it only the martyrs? No. So why does Revelation, why does the, uh, the first part of the, se of the sixth seal say that the martyrs are going to be judged and the 144,000 are going to be judged? So that means that nobody else is going to be judged, right? No. 
the fact that you have a uh, you have a an emphasis does not mean that it excludes the broader picture. So as the books of record are opened in the judgment, the lives of all who have believed on Jesus come in review before God. Would that include Presbyterians and Lutherans and, uh, and uh, Church of Christ and Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons? Yes, everybody who has ever claimed Christ. Now how does it transpire chronologically? Beginning with those who first lived upon the earth. Our advocate presents the cases of each successive generation, would that include the martyrs? Yes. And closes with whom? With the living. When the, when the living are judged, are we still in the first part of the sixth seal? Yes. Because the second part of the sixth seal is when Jesus comes, and the signs in the heavens announce His coming. Ellen White wrote about the second part of the sixth seal, the avenging part, in Great Controversy 641 and 642. Here Ellen White quotes Revelation 614 through 17, and then I have several other passages in Scripture that, that you need to take a look at in your personal study. Revelation 19, 3 through 10 presents a great multitude standing victoriously in heaven. Revelation 19, verses 1 and 2 clearly indicates that at this point the avenging has already what? Taken place. At this point God has judged the harlot and avenged His people. Revelation 19, 17 and 18 marks the reference to the same groups of people as Revelation 6, 15 and 16. Now let's read this passage from the chapter God's people delivered so that we can catch the, the, the sequence of events. Before His presence all faces are turned into paleness. Upon the rejectors of God's mercy falls the terror of eternal despair. The heart melteth and the knees smite together, and the faces of them all gather blackness. The righteous cry with trembling, Who shall be able to stand? That's the last question in the sixth seal, right? The second part of the sixth seal. The angel's song is hushed, and there is a period of awful silence. What comes immediately after the question, who shall be able to stand? Well, the seventh seal. And what do you have in the seventh seal? Silence in heaven. So what is the silence in heaven for this short period of about a half an hour? It is this silence that is mentioned here, where the, the, the voices of the singing angels are, are hushed. Uh, so notice it continues saying, the angel song is hushed, and there is a period of awful silence. Then the voice of Jesus is heard saying, my grace is sufficient for you. The faces of the righteous are lighted up, and joy fills every heart and the angels strike a note higher and sing again as they draw near to the earth. Then she's going to quote Revelation 6, 14 to 17. The king of kings descends upon the cloud, wrapped in flaming fire. The heavens are rolled together as a scroll. The earth trembles before him, and every mountain and island is moved out of its place. Is that the sixth seal, the second part of the sixth seal? Yes. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before Him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about Him. He shall call the heavens from above and to the earth that He may judge His people. And then she actually quotes verses 15 to 17. And the kings of the earth and the great men, the rich men, the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And then I want you to notice that the wicked are going to ask the same question. She continues, The derisive jests have ceased. Lying lips are hushed into silence. The clash of arms, the tumult of battle with confused noise and garments rolled in blood is stilled. Not now is heard, but the voice of prayer and the sound of weeping and lamentation. The cry bursts forth from lips so lately scoffing. 
the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? So the wicked are going to ask the question too, aren't they? The wicked pray to be buried beneath the rocks of the mountains, rather than meet the face of him whom they have despised and rejected. Do you see the sequence of events? How did Ellen White know how to put all this stuff in order? Lucky guess. No, I don't think so. Because she was inspired. The Holy Spirit gave her the information of how to write it. Because the Holy Spirit not only imparts the message to the prophet, but helps the prophet write. That's why Ellen White many times, uh, you know, she would lay down the pen and she would pray. The Lord help me with this, you know, because she, she, she was not proficient in writing. She had to learn to write. She had a two and a half years of primary education, elementary education. When you really consider that, she would have had to have been inspired. <laughs> when we read her writings of a person who had only two and a half years of primary education. Now let's pursue the question that is asked at the end of the sixth seal, the second half of the sixth seal. The great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? What does the word stand mean? In several places in the New Testament, the word appears as an antonym of fall. In other words, the word stand is the opposite of fall. Notice these verses that I have, there's more in the New Testament, but I just gave a sampling. A kingdom divided it against itself cannot stand. You could say cannot survive. In other words, a kingdom divided against itself is doomed to fall. Satan at the beginning did not stand in the truth. What does that mean, he did not stand in the truth? It means that he fell from the truth. The Apostle Paul stated, He that thinks that he stands, let him take heed lest he fall. So there you have the two ideas. To stand is not to fall. And then you have in Ephesians 6, 11 to 13, it says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to what? To stand. In other words, so you don't fall for the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Are you catching a picture of what it means, what the question is? Who will be able to stand? In other words, who's not going to fall? Who's going to remain firm and solid in the great day of Christ's wrath? 2 Timothy 2.19 Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And then you have Luke 21.36, which is speaking directly about the second coming. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things because he's mentioned all the signs that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. What are God's people going to say when Jesus comes? Lo, this is our God. We have waited for Him and He will save us. So while the wicked are saying, who's going to be able to stand? And they're running to hide in the caves and crying for the rocks to fall on them. God's people with hands stretched out are saying, lo, this is our God. We have waited for Him and He will save us. Why? Because everyone who names the name of Christ departs from iniquity, is what the Apostle Paul tells us. Now, Revelation 6, 17 ends with a question. The great day of His wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Where will you expect to find the answer to that question? How about the next chapter? Listen carefully now. The next chapter takes us back 
because verse 17 is describing the second coming of Christ. Too late to be saved, too late to be sealed. So chapter 7 is going to take us back to answer who's going to be able to stand. Those who before probation closed were what? Were sealed. Are you with me or not? So Revelation 7 is not in chronolo chronological order with 617. 617 reaches the climax, the signs in the heavens, Jesus is coming, who shall be able to stand? And so the question is, who's going to be able to stand? So John is going to say now in his writing, he's going to say, let me tell you who's going to be able to stand. Those who were sealed, the 144,000 who were sealed during probationary time, at the very end of probationary time, they are the ones that are going to be able to stand. Notice Revelation chapter 7 verses 1 through 4. After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. So let me ask, ask you, is probation still open here? Of course, because they're holding the winds of strife. When they let them loose, that's the time of trouble. So they're standing, they're holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Those are all symbolic words. We won't get into that now. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have what? In other words, don't release the winds, don't cause harm, don't permit the cataclysm to come, until what? Until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Does the sealing take place before the second coming? Does it take place before the close of probation? Absolutely. So it says, and I heard the number of those who were sealed, we'll deal with this when we talk about the interlude, and I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. And by the way, we're dealing with spiritual Israel here. We're not dealing with literal Israelites. Now this idea of sealing on the forehead comes from Ezekiel chapter 9. Now we're not going to go there fully and completely, I'm just going to mention something about Ezekiel chapter 9. In Ezekiel chapter 8 you have the deplorable condition among those who profess to be God's people. We're not talking about the Egyptians and the Babylonians and the surrounding nations. We're talking about what was happening among God's professed people. The leaders were uh, turning their back to the temple and they were worshiping the sun to the east. That was the greatest abomination because chapter 8, uh, God shows in chapter 8 to Ezekiel an abomination and Ezekiel says, wow, that's bad, Lord. God says, you ain't, see, you ain't seen nothing yet. I'll show you a worse abomination than that. And so God shows him another abomination and Ezekiel says, that's bad. God says, you haven't seen anything yet. I'll show you a worse one than this. And the one that is the worst of all was worshiping the sun. And then in the very next chapter, verses 16 and 17 talk about worshiping the sun. The very next chapter speaks about an angel with an ink horn and is coming to seal his servants on their foreheads. Who is the one who is sealed? Those who sigh and cry because of the abominations that are being committed among God's people. What would that be equivalent to in the end time? The loud cry. Because the message is for those who profess to be God's people. Not only Adventists, but non-Adventists. And so what are the faithful going to be doing at the end of time? They're going to be participating in the sins that are being committed in the religious world? No! They're going to be sighing and crying because of the abominations that take place in the earth. And then, you know, I don't know of anybody that sighs and cries in silence. This is talking about sighing and crying. This is talking about crying out because of the abominations that are being committed in the earth. So God is going to place His seal upon those. The seal, of course, is, is the Sabbath. We're going to study that a little bit later towards the end of this series. He's going to place His seal on those who sigh and cry because of the abominations 
that are being committed in the world. And the purpose of the seal is to, so that the angels can identify who is faithful and so that the angels can protect them when probation closes and the time of trouble comes. Now, Revelation 7 doesn't describe the character of this group. Revelation chapter 7 simply says that the seal, the protective seal is placed on them. So you ask the question, what were they like? Why were they able to stand? Well, because they had the seal. But why did they have the seal? We have to go to chapter 14 for that, where the same group is mentioned. Revelation 14 verses 1 through 5. By the way, Revelation 14, 1 through 5 really should be the conclusion to chapter 13. Chapter 13 be speaks about the trial over the beast, over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name. So when you get to the, the end of chapter 13, you say, well, did everybody worship the beast? Did everybody worship the image of the beast? Did everyone receive the mark of the beast so that they could buy and sell and so they wouldn't be killed? When chapter 13 ends, it looks like the whole world has gone awry. But chapter 14, 1 through 5 says there was a group that did not receive the mark of the beast or worship the beast or his image. And that group is called 144,000, the sealed ones. But now we're going to know why they're sealed. Verse 1, Then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having what? His father's name written on their foreheads. What's behind your forehead? Your frontal lobe, the center of decision, right? Where you make decisions for life or for death, moral decisions. What does the Father's name mean? The name in the Bible represents the character of the person who bears the name. My parents called me Stephen Paul, not because they thought that Stephen Paul sounded nice, because they wanted to be they wanted me to be like the martyr and the martyrizer. <laughs> no, they didn't want me to be like the martyrizer, except after his conversion. In other words, they, they gave me that name because they said, we want Steve to be like Stephen and like Paul. There was a purpose. They wanted me to reflect the character of these two individuals. I'm not worthy to, to, to tie their, their sandals because these were, these were incredibly great men. But the Father's name means to have the character. And the forehead means in your mind. God is going to write His law in our minds and in our hearts. He continues saying, And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang as it were a new song because they went, to, they went through a, an experience that no other group has ever gone through. They've gone through the time of trouble. So it says, they sang a new song, as it were a new song, before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. So they never got married, right? No! They did not have illicit relationships with the apostate churches, with the harlot and her daughters. We're dealing with symbols here. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes, including Gethsemane and the cross. These were redeemed from among men, being firstfruits to God and to the Lamb, and in their mouth was found no deceit. Which means that there's no deceit in their heart. Because from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. For they are without fault before the throne of God. Now we know why they received the seal. Why did they receive the seal? Because they had a sterling character. They had an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. They reflected the image of Jesus fully. They followed Jesus wherever He goes, this end time generation. Now this is not the only place where this question appears. The great day of His wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Let's examine some other places where this question appears. Joel 2 verse 11. 
Joel 2 verse 11 is the culmination of a description of the second coming. We're not going to read verses 1 through 10, but it's describing the second coming. And notice how the second coming comes to an end. The question is asked again, just like in Revelation 6. The Lord gives His voice before His army, for His camp is very great. For strong is the one who executes His word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Is that the same basic question? Yes. Where would you expect to find the answer? How about the following verses? Incidentally, the following verses are describing the Day of Atonement. Do you know on the Day of Atonement, not only did the priest cleanse the sanctuary, but the people also had to afflict their souls and cleanse their lives in parallel fashion to what was happening in the sanctuary. Notice the terminology here, how this is referring to the Day of Atonement. Are we now in the Day of Atonement? Yes. Is the Day of Atonement going to come to an end? Yes. What will happen for, with those who have not sent their, their sins to the sanctuary? They will not be able to stand. Notice the answer to the question. Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, the Day of Atonement was the only fast required in the Hebrew uh, religious calendar. With, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Does this sound like sighing and crying? Yes. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. For He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and He relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. What was it that announced the Day of Atonement? Trumpets. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Once again, the only day required for a fast was the Day of Atonement. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the, other, uh, the elders, gather the children nursing babes. Nobody exempt from gathering. Let the bridegroom go up from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. In other words, you know, the, the, it's a priority to get a character ready for the coming of the Lord. And what are the priests supposed to be doing? What are they supposed to be doing? Encouraging the church to jump and roll in the aisles. No! Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? So who are the ones that are going to be able to endure the great day of God's wrath? Those that successfully pass through the Day of Atonement. Through fasting, weeping, mourning over sin, rending the heart, gathering around the heavenly sanctuary by faith, returning to God, and praying that the Lord will spare His people. That's not the only place where the question is asked. Isaiah 33, verses 14 through 16. You have a question. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? You know, you ask uh, people from other churches, you know, um, what's going to happen with the wicked? They say, well, they're going to burn in the fires of hell forever. They're going to be in the fire forever and ever, writhing in pain. Surprise, surprise, the only ones who are going to be able to live in the fire are the righteous, not the wicked. <laughs> you say, what? You know, you have a little example of this, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The fire didn't burn them. They were in the midst of the fire. And that was a little human fire. Now notice the answer to the question. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Very similar to the question of Revelation 6, 17. Now comes the answer. Notice the, the emphasis on lifestyle, conduct. 
the way that people live their lives, practical godliness. Here's the answer, he who walks righteously. By the way, the, in, when the Bible speaks about walking in a symbolic way, it's speaking about your behavior. He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly. He who despises the gain of oppressions, who gestures with his hands, refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. He will dwell on high, his place of defense will be the fortress of rocks, bread will be given him, and water will be sure. A reference to the great multitude, they will thirst no more and they will hunger no more. That's not the only place the question is asked. Psalm 15 and verse 1, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? What is God's holy hill? Mount Zion. Where are the 144,000 standing? On Mount Zion. So who will abide in your tabernacle or in your sanctuary? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Now once again the answer is your conduct, the life. He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth from his heart he who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change, he doesn't break his promises in other words. He who does not put out his money at usury, he doesn't charge an exorbitant amount of interest, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. And now notice the end. He who does these things shall never be moved. In other words, shall be able to what? To stand. That's not the only place the question is asked. Psalm 24, verses 3 through 6. This is the song that was sung when Jesus ascended to heaven the first time. When Jesus returns to heaven, the question will be once asked once more. Who may ascend into the holy hill, or who may stand in his holy place? Where would you expect to find the answer in the following verses? Notice once again the emphasis on lifestyle and conduct. And you're saying, well, Pastor Bohr believes that we're saved because of our lifestyle. No, no, no. I'm saying that when we know Jesus and we have an intimate relationship with Jesus, our lifestyle will change. The change is an evidence of salvation, it is not the cause of salvation. Amen. Let me ask you, when you uh, turn on your car in the morning, when the road is in good condition, there's no snow, no, it hasn't rained, and you put your car in drive, which wheels move first, the front wheels or the back wheels? <laughs> well. Somebody always asks, is it front wheel drive or back wheel drive? <laughs> Let's suppose it's back wheel drive. What happens as soon as the back wheels move? The front wheels follow. Where there is true saving faith, works follow. That's why Paul, we have Paul and we have James. Paul says we're justified by faith without works of law. And James says, yes, by a faith that works. Because a faith that doesn't work isn't faith. You know, if God said to Noah, Noah, build an ark for me. There's going to be a flood. Noah says, thank you, Lord, for this great revelation. And sits. How did Noah show that he believed God when it had never rained? He got the hammers, and he got the saws, and he got the nails and he started building. That's why faith without works is dead. True faith is a working faith. Faith is an action word. That's why you have the emphasis on lifestyle here. It's not that the lifestyle is saving you, the lifestyle is showing that you're saved. So notice verses 4 through 6 has the answer. He who has clean hands and a pure heart 
who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. And then after describing, the, the question is asked, after describing the lifestyle, then you have the entrance into heaven. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, lift, uh, lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. So your lifestyle reveals whether you're ready to enter into heaven. And I'm not going to read the last statement because time is flying by. But uh, we notice that at the second coming, the Father is not coming at the second coming. Neither are the cherubim and the seraphim. Neither are the representatives of the worlds. Neither the Holy Spirit, because He's been withdraw withdrawn from the earth at the close of probation. Who's going to come? Jesus and the holy angels. And then they will begin the journey back to heaven. And this hymn will be sung. And who will be waiting at the gate of the city to wel at the gates of the city to welcome his children home? The Father of all mercies, it says in this quotation, will be there. And he'll say, Welcome home, children. This is the place I prepared for you, as the song goes. That's not the only place where the question is asked, though. Notice Nahum. 1 verses 6 and 7, who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust him, that is those who have faith in him. The question is also asked in Malachi 3, verses 1 to 3. Behold, I send my messenger. This is speaking about John the Baptist in its original context. At the end of time, it's God's people that prepare the way for the coming of Christ. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. He came in 1844 to judge the dead, but then he's going to come to judge the living. Even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight... Behold, He is coming, says the Lord of hosts, but who can endure the day of His coming? And who can stand when He appears? For He is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Notice Ellen White's comment. Says the prophet, Who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. She's quoting the passage that we just read from Malachi. And then comes her comment, Those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above, are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Their robes must be spotless. Their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, you say, oh, so it's 50-50. <laughs> Who gives us the ability to put forth efforts? God does. Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be what? Conquerors in the battle with evil. While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of purification, of putting away of sin among God's people upon earth, this work is more clearly presented in the messages of Revelation 
14. The beautiful thing is, folks, those individuals who have this intimate relationship with Jesus Christ because they have spent time with Christ. How do we come to know someone? By spending time with them, right? How do we come to know Jesus? By spending time with Him in prayer, in Bible study, talking about Him passionately. You know, when I, uh, I also was a student in our university in Columbia. I studied three years of my college down there. There were eight of us in one room uh, because there were lots of students back then. And I had a guy in our room that had this girlfriend. And from the time that he came through the door till the time that he left, he was always talking about his girlfriend. He just about drove us crazy. Oh, she's this and she's so beautiful for this and she did this and she did that. Why did he talk so much about her? Duh, because he loved her. So if we love Jesus, how is it that we don't tell anybody that we love Jesus? Why don't we witness about Jesus? Say, oh, you need to know my beloved Jesus. See? Isaiah 54 verses 8 through 10 tells us that God will protect those who have an intimate relationship with Christ through Bible study, prayer, and through talking to others about Jesus with a little wrath. God is speaking here, I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness I will have mercy on you, says the Lord your Redeemer. For this is like the waters of Noah to me. So she's going to referring to the days of Noah. This is a, a, a reference to the second coming. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so I have sworn that I would not be angry with, with you nor rebuke you. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. Amen. Isn't that a beautiful promise? Yes. And then we have Psalm 46. Oh, what a beautiful psalm. It inspired Martin Luther to write, A mighty fortress is our God. In fact, he's paraphrasing some of the phrases that we find in Psalm 46. And I'm going to read it. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. This is the time of trouble. Therefore we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Is this describing that time? Yes. Though its waters roar and be troubled. That's Luke 21. Though the mountains shake with its swelling, Selah. And then comes an interesting sudden contrast. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God. Suddenly there's a real peaceful scene here. The holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be what? Moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. And then he goes back to to what the other that he was talking to. That was just a little parenthetical statement. Once again, now the psalmist says the nations raged, the kingdoms were moved, he uttered his voice, the earth melted, the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord who has made desolations in the earth, he makes wars to cease in the earth, he breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two, he burns the chariot in fire, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. These are the promises that we have to claim during that period because the whole world will be allied against God's people. Now do you remember in the introductory vision that Jesus is seen as a lamb as a li- and a lion? Let me ask you, in which way are a lamb and a lion similar? They're totally opposites. So how is it that Jesus can be presented as a lamb and as a lion? There's a paradox here. On page 279, in Sons and Daughters of God, page 358, Ellen Wright wrote, The Lion of Judah, so terrible to the rejecters of His grace, will be the Lamb of God to the obedient and faithful. The pillar of fire that speaks terror and wrath to the transgressor of God's law. 
is a token of light and mercy and deliverance to those have, who have kept His commandments. The strong arm to smite the rebellious will be strong to deliver the loyal. In another statement she wrote, Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1107, the death of Christ brings to the rejecter of His mercy the wrath and judgments of God unmixed with mercy. That's the plagues, isn't it? Unmixed with mercy. This is what? The wrath of the Lamb. Now the next paragraph is very important. In the garden and on the cross, Jesus drank the cup of the wrath of God without mixture. Is that true? John 18, verse 11, Jesus says, uh, speaks about drinking the cup that His Father has given Him. He drank it for how many people? For every person who has ever lived. Those who receive Jesus as personal Savior, those who claim the life and the death of Christ, will not have to drink the cup because Christ drank the cup for them. However, those who reject the cross of Jesus, they reject Christ, they reject His drinking the cup in their place, will have to drink their own cup of the wrath of God without mixture of mercy. Final page. Now if Ellen White quotes Revelation 6, 12, and 13 in Great Controversy 304 and 333, and then quotes Revelation 6, 14 to 17, in Great Controversy 641 and 642, then the sealing must take place in between these two periods, and this is exactly the case. So we know where the interlude fits, fits right? It's the final sealing of those who are alive. It is interesting to study the sequence of chapters between pages 304 and 641, because would we expect the interlude to be between page uh, 333 and page 641? Would we expect that Revelation 7 interlude to fit in there somewhere? Absolutely. So what do we find in those chapters in between? Well, Ellen White portrays William Miller. <laughs> what did William Miller announce? The hour of his judgment. We have chapters on the three angels' messages. Jesus' work in the most holy place, the sealing, the close of probation, and the time of trouble. And then she expounds upon the last part of the sixth seal in Great Controversy 641 and 642. So if you want to know everything that's going to happen between page 333 and page 641, all you have to do is study the chapters in between, and you'll get the full picture. Thus we must study the fifth and sixth seals together. The sixth seal answers the pleas of the two groups of martyrs in the fifth. From 538 to 1798, God's martyrs were crying out for justice. God gave those white robes and told them to rest a while until the second group of martyrs is complete. In 1844, the process of judging the little horn and throwing out the verdicts of human courts began. The judgment began with the dead who trusted in Jesus, including the martyrs, of course. Then the judgment of the living will take place at the very end of the judgment. After God judges the dead and the living, He will destroy the little horn at the second coming and give His saints the kingdom. Thus God will have judged the little horn and avenged His people. And then what is going to happen? Well, let's notice the last paragraph. Ellen White quotes, Revelation 7, 9 through 17, which speaks of the great multitude which no one can numbers, and Revelation 14, 1 through 5, in great controversy, 648, 649, and 665. On page 646, those who overcame received from Jesus the crown, the name, and the harp. At this point, God's people have joined Jesus where? On the throne, as was promised in Revelation 3.21. You remember what Revelation 3.21 said? To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat with my Father on His throne. So what is the picture of the seals? We still haven't dealt with the seventh seal, except very briefly. Basically, the seven seals 
cover the period from the inauguration of Christ through the events that take place in Christian history, culminating with the sealing, the time of trouble, and the second coming of Christ. And what's going to happen with the overcomers? Jesus came to this earth, overcame, sat with His Father in His throne. During the period of the seven seals, actually the six, first six seals, what are God's people doing? They're overcoming, right? And then the great multitude, it says, will be there at the throne. In other words, the seven seals are the period between the time when we overcome and finally sit with Jesus on His throne. So, what do you think? Do you understand the seals a little bit better now? You know, it's not just a, a whole bunch of symbolism that nobody can understand. All we have to do is look at the symbols. We have to look at the context. We have to compare other verses. We have to look at the structure, the sequence of events, in other words. And then, all of the studies that we've done, we put it all together, and we have a mosaic. We have a complete picture of exactly what is going on to transpire. So the question is, who is going to be able to stand? Folks, it is time for us to get serious about our personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. Amen. It's time for us to open the scriptures and to search the scriptures, not read them. Yeah, reading is okay, but search the scriptures. Feed ourselves with the word, because the word is bread. Let the light come in so that it can shine through us. It's also time for us to be a people of prayer. You know, in prayer, in prayer we speak to Jesus, and in the Bible Jesus speaks to us. And then it is also time for us to get off our warm chairs and start telling people about the wonderful relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. And of course we can't tell people about a wonderful relationship unless we have it. And so we live, I believe, in the last segments of the time of, the history, uh, of time, or of the history of the world. Things are happening right and left, which indicate clearly that we are in the very threshold of the final events of the book of Revelation. So I trust that what we've studied will be a benefit and an inspiration to us, so that we will form this deep, profound relationship with Jesus.